Okay, I'll let everybody come on in and get settled. It's good to see everybody here this morning. This morning we're going to begin the study of the text of Revelation. And uh, the outline that I've given you is actually Revelation chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. So we're going to start now by reading the first three verses. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place, and his sin is signified by his angel and his servant, to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. First of all, the very first verse points out Jesus Christ, God, his servants, and his angels. The book of Revelation is a book that is telling us about spiritual warfare. And on one side of the spiritual battle is God, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, and the angels. And also in the physical realm, God's servants. On the other side of the spiritual battle is Satan, Satan's angels. And then you have the physical realm, those who are allied with Satan. And we're going to be seeing significantly in the book of Revelation, we're talking about the means through which Satan is going to make war against God's people, the church. So we're talking about the Roman Empire, the capital being Rome, uh, that was making war against the church. And then we're going to be talking about the sea beast and the land beast, uh, the false religion through which Christians are going to be persecuted. And then we're talking about the kings of the earth, those who are participating in the persecution of Christianity, and even those who submit and worship the beast. And that is going to be all of those who worship Satan, basically. So on one side, you've got God, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, the angels, and in the physical realm, God's servants. On the other side, spiritual realm, Satan, his angels. In the physical realm, the Roman Empire, the kings of the Roman Empire, and those who worship the beast. It is a book about spiritual warfare with physical manifestations. And the physical manifestations that are concerning the Christians is going to be their being persecuted to the point of death. As I told you, chapter 2 and verse 10, if you want one verse, that tells you what the entire book is about is chapter 2, verse 10. How the devil's about to cast some of you into prison. You can have tribulation 10 days, be faithful to death, and I'll give you the crown of life. <clears throat> That's what the book is about. Now then, the text in chapter 1, verse 1, tells us how the book is meant to be interpreted. When he says, things which must shortly take place. And then again in verse 3, for the time is near. Now, I want you to tell me what does it mean when it says things that must shortly take place? What does that mean? It means what it says, exactly. Things that must shortly take place. If I ever ask you what that means, just say the verse back to me, and you'll have the answer correct. It means exactly what it says. Things that must shortly take place, for the time is near. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing that is because you find the same thing said over the 22nd chapter at the close of the book of Revelation how it's things that must shortly take place, and the time is at hand. And so, the premillennial concept of the idea of it's taking place in our time right now doesn't fit, because 2,024 years is not near, not shortly taking place. The historical approach to the idea of the Roman Inquisition and the Reformation movement and the Restoration movement in, in Europe does not fit because, again, even if you take it as early as the 14 and 1500s, that, that's not near. 16 and 1800s is not near. It's not shortly taking place. The book of Revelation is dealing with things that were going to shortly take place that was near. And you're going to be even seeing as we go further in here in verse 9 how John talks about he was a companion in the tribulation. It was present active already. And John was already going through it. Uh, you're going to see in verse 2 a particular phrase, two phrases that are going to be used throughout the book of Revelation. It is the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. You're going to be seeing, for instance, when you drop down uh, to uh, verse 9, I, John, both your brother and companion of the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos, look at this, 
for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so Paul, so John, the, the, the apostle, was taken as a prisoner. If you don't know, Patmos is a Roman prison island. Uh, think of Alcatraz, but much bigger and much further out in the ocean. Uh, it was a Roman prison island. Uh, and that is where John is located at the time that he received this revelation. And so he talks about how he was in the tribulation, companion in tribulation again, present active tense. Tribulation's already going on, and he's telling the congregations and the Christians across the Christian empire and the Christian world what's going to be happening to them soon. Okay, that's verses 1 through 3. Now then, getting to the body more, if we should say, Verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. We're talking about Asia at this time as a Roman province, not China. Roman province in what we call Western Turkey today. And so he's writing to congregations that exist in the province of Asia. And he says, grace to you and peace from him who, who is, who was, who is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Okay, our class this morning is going to be taking this particular text and breaking it down. Because what I'm trying to show you here is at the very beginning, you have the introduction of what we sometimes refer to as the Godhead. When I say the Godhead, I'm talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, you will find that they are mentioned together in numerous places throughout the New Testament. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit together. Uh, but we're going to take this text and I'm going to try to show you how this is talking about the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit, when he's referred to as the seven spirits, the word Holy Spirit is nowhere in the book of Revelation. Just, just telling you right up front, you go, go get your concordance, look up Holy Spirit, and you're not going to find that in the book of Revelation. Uh, you will find God, you'll find Jesus, but you won't find the phrase Holy Spirit. You'll find the word Spirit, but you won't find the phrase Holy Spirit. In my class last week, I tried to teach you about symbolism in numbers. What does the number seven represent in the Hebrew world? Holy. Number seven is the holiest number of all. And so what I'm going to do, this is not on your outline. If you're looking for where this is on your outline, I'm trying to show you the introduction to several of the epistles of the New Testament and how they begin. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, grace and peace is a combination of the Greek and the Jewish greeting, shalom and charisma. And then you have part of the Godhead, God the Father, Lord Jesus Christ. I'm wanting you to see this comes after grace and peace to you, and then you have God the Father, Jesus the Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you already seeing the pattern? Grace and peace, and it's from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit's not mentioned. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, Lord Jesus Christ. By now, if you haven't seen the pattern, you're not paying attention. Uh, you have grace and peace from God the Father, Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, I believe 1 Thessalonians is the first revelation received through the Apostle Paul that he penned and wrote to the congregation of Thessalonica. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you noticing that's exactly the same thing you find over the Galatian letter? And by the way, these are written at different times over Paul, Peter, John, over, over different times in their life. All I'm trying to show you is a common pattern at the beginning of the letters whenever they're having basically the greetings. This is from Peter now, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So there's the grace and peace, God, Jesus our Lord. 2 John, verse 3. Grace, mercy, and peace will be to you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. 
Okay, so you see Peter, Paul, John, whenever they're writing, they use grace and peace, and it's from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now then, go back, if you will, to Revelation 1 and verse 4. John of the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace. See that right there, grace to you and peace. Right after that, in the other epistles comes who? God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. So here in the Revelation, letter chapter 1, verse 4, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. All right. This is a way of referring to God the Father. Do you remember whenever Moses in the book of Exodus was talking with God at the burning bush and asking this question, when they ask, who sent me, what am I supposed to answer? And the answer is, I am who I am. And so we get the concept of I am from which we get to the name of God even. He is someone who is, always has been, always will be. He is an eternal being. He always has been, he is, he always will be. Do you see that here in the text? Who is, present tense, who was, past tense, who is to come, future tense. He is eternal. He is the great I am. This is another way of saying I am. Now, as you go through Revelation chapter 1 and throughout the book of Revelation, you're going to find this phrase, who is, who was, and who is to come. You're going to find it in different places. In chapter 1, verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, notice that phrase, the Almighty. That is a designate specifically of God the Father. But I want you to also notice something here I did not put in yellow tint, and that is I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Uh, we talked about this last week in our triplication study, you remember? How he talks about how I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, where he's saying the same thing three different ways. The idea is everything that was brought into existence was brought into existence by God the Father, and God the Father is going to be the one that's going to take everything that exists out of existence in the end. He's the beginning. He's the end. The same phrases are going to be used later on applied to Jesus. Let that sink in. The phrases right here applied to God Almighty, the Father, are later on going to be used applies to Jesus. Because was Jesus involved in creation? Yes. Is he going to be involved in taking creation out? Yes. And, and so you're going to be finding just as God the Father is God, so is Jesus, I'm going to refer to him now as the Lamb. Because you're going to be seeing as we go through the book of Revelation, one of the main ways Jesus is going to be referred to, especially in chapter 5 and following, is worthy is the Lamb, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But right now, I'm just wanting you to see two things, Alpha and the Omega, at the beginning and the end, goes to God the Father. Almighty goes to God the Father, and he's also called here who is, who was, who is to come again, the great I Am. Now chapter 4. Chapter 4, if you don't know in the book of Revelation, is the chapter that focuses in primarily on God on, on his throne. The whole fourth chapter is about God on his throne. And uh, th this is significant. In what is depicted in the fourth chapter, which you'll find, by the way, the same thing in Ezekiel, part of it also the same concept in Isaiah 6. But in Revelation 4, you have God on his throne, surrounded by the four living creatures, which are cherubim, if you don't know them. And then outside that are the 24 thrones and the 24 elders. Okay, but inside the circle of the four living beasts you're going to be seeing is God on his throne, seven spirits of God, and the Lamb. That is significant because of their location inside the circle of the four cherubim is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the only point I'm trying to make from that right now. But getting back to the text and reading it, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. There's the phrase again, who was, who is and is to come. But now we have a little bit more about him. Holy, holy, holy. As I've told you in the class last week, 
in the tabernacle and the temple, when they were built, the front part of it where the priests were allowed to go was called the holy place. Where the curtain was that separated the holy place from where the Ark of the Covenant was and the mercy seat of God, only one individual was allowed to go in there once a year, the high priest, and that is referred to as the holy of holies or most holy. So you have a duplicating of the holy of holies in the back of the temple where the mercy seat is. When you're referring to God himself, that's when you get the triplicate, holy holy, holy. That is the highest level of holiness there is. That is only referring to God the Father. Notice again, Lord God, there it is again, Almighty. As we told you earlier, the Almighty is always referring to God the Father. And again, you find the same phrase, who was, who is, and is to come. Revelation 11, verse 17. Saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is, who was, who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. And so here in Revelation 11, by the way, if you don't know, Revelation 11 is primary to the two witnesses. And after the event of the two witnesses, praise is given to God, Lord God Almighty. We've already learned that already. And there's the same phrase again. All I'm trying to do is show you, you see this phrase scattered throughout the book of Revelation. How many of you even paid attention to it before? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm trying to bring your attention to it and what it is saying and what it is and how it is scattered throughout the book of Revelation. Revelation 16, verse 5. Context talking about harlot, the great harlot Babylon. And I heard the angel of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is, who was, who is to come, because you have judged these things. And so finally, God renders judgment on Babylon the harlot and punishes, I believe, the Roman Empire for their sins of killing Christians. And so all I'm trying to do is show you from Revelation 1 and 4 all the way through Revelation 16 and 5, you're going to be seeing this phrase, who is, who was, who is to be, or is to come. That's dealing with God the Father, the great I Am. Now then, the seven spirits. Um... Who are the seven spirits? Because notice, the, and this is crucial, notice the location of the phrase. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And so in the context here, I'm trying to show you, that's why I opened up with the opening of the other epistles. Anytime you have the phrase grace to you and peace, what comes after it is the Godhead. Have you already, do you remember the pattern I showed you at the opening? What comes after that phrase is God. The Godhead is referred to it. God and Jesus primarily, but in the text here, is God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So the point I'm trying to make, Fancher's commentary in explaining it to you, is that the seven spirits who are before his throne is a way of saying the Holy Spirit. Seven is the holy number. The phrase Holy Spirit is found nowhere in the book of Revelation. You will find the word spirit. John talked about earlier how he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. The word spirit is used even when you get to the very close of it. Who says come? Spirit, bride, say come. Okay, so the spirit, I believe, is referring to the Holy Spirit. But here it is referred to, or he is referred to specifically as the seven spirits, but this is crucial, who are before the throne. Their location in the text and their location in the vision are crucial to understand who it is. Later on, we're going to be seeing how the seven spirits are on the head of the Lamb. <laughs> and so there's a connection between the Lamb, who is Jesus Christ, and the seven spirits. The point I'm trying to make is there's a connection between Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And also right here, the location within the circle, if you will, of the four living beasts. As I point out to you, you have the Lamb and you have the seven spirits. If the seven spirits are located within the circle of the four living beasts, they're God in the subject, just simply because of the location in the text. Are you following me or am I too deep? Okay, thank you, Linda. All right, so again, I've already shown you grace and peace. Whenever you go and you read the other epistles, what comes after that is the Godhead. The book of Revelation is no different. And when you understand the book of Revelation is no different, because it comes right after God the Father, you have the seven spirits who are before the throne. He says, and, 
from the seven spirits who are before the throne. So let's go and look about these seven spirits in the book of Revelation. Chapter 3, verse 1. And of the angel of the church in Sardis write these things, who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. And so in the context here, Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, that this is the letter to the church in Sardis. Jesus talks about how himself, he has the seven spirits of God. Uh, I think I've got it on here. No, not yet. We'll get, we'll, it's, it is coming, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold off on making the comment right now. Revelation 4 and 5. And from the throne proceed lightnings, thunders, and voices. Seven lamps of the fire, of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Um, I'm, I'm, going, I'm trying to go into my brain because I've put more stuff on the PowerPoint that's not on the outline. And so if I come up with this verse later on, then I'm just going to make the point twice. All right, where are the seven spirits of God? Before the throne, we've already seen that twice. They're referred to also as seven lamps of fire. The point I'm trying to make right now is when you go into the tabernacle or the temple into the holy place, there were actually three things there. Two of them were just positions across from each other, and one was over by the veil. The one over by the veil was the golden altar of incense. But on one side, you had the table for the showbread, the 12 loaves of bread. On the other side, you have what we call a menorah. How many branches were there on a menorah? Seven. The point I'm trying to make is in the tabernacle, in the temple, the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat represents God on his throne in heaven. On the other side, you have the 12 loaves of bread, which I believe represents Christ, who is the bread of life. And on the other side, you've got the menorah, which I believe represents the Holy Spirit. Too deep? Makes sense. Good. Okay. So the point I'm trying to make here, again, before the throne of God, you have the seven spirits of God, which he calls the seven lamps of fire. The seven lamps of fire, I believe, is going back to the menorah and the tabernacle and the temple. And again, the point I'm trying to make is, if that's the case, then the seven spirits of God is another way of saying the Holy Spirit. Location is crucial, and connection to Jesus is crucial. Revelation 5. If you don't know this, Revelation 4 is about God and his throne. Revelation 5 is about the Lamb, Jesus the Christ. The primary characters in the book of Revelation are God and Jesus. Just make no mistake about that. The primary characters in the book of Revelation are God and Jesus. The fifth chapter is the introduction primarily of Jesus as the Lamb. He's already been introduced in the very first verse. And he's already been introduced the first chapter in the greeting. But here in the fifth chapter is where he's introduced as the Lamb. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a Lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Okay. The Lamb, again, is in the midst of the throne. So right up by the throne is this Lamb, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. This is why he's referred to, I believe, as the Lamb. But notice what it says about the Lamb. The Lamb has seven eyes, which are the seven spirits. What do eyes do? See, the idea, I believe, of the seven eyes, the Holy Spirit through which Jesus sees, through which God sees, the idea is the Holy Spirit is sent out and is seeing and knowing everything that's going on in the world. The omniscience of God. Now then, having said that, this is not on your outline. I didn't want to give you a three-page outline. I'm just, that's just silly, I know. But so if you're taking notes, you might want to write this over in the side. I was trying to show you the connection here between Jesus and the Holy Spirit because we've already seen there's a connection there in the book of Revelation between Jesus and the Holy Spirit. How this, the, uh, Jesus says in Revelation 3 and 1, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. The seven spirits are in the hand of Christ. He's in control of them. And the Holy Spirit is the one that the Lamb is on, the connection between the concept of even them being on the head of the Lamb. There's a very strong connection between the Holy Spirit and Jesus. You find in, Revel in John chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him 
to you. And then in verse 12 and 13, the same chapter. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Now, this is crucial. And he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. Okay, this is crucial to understanding the role of the Holy Spirit in the Godhead in our salvation. All revelation begins with God the Father. And then it goes from God the Father through the mediator, Jesus Christ. And from the mediator to who? The Holy Spirit. If you can understand that, then you can understand what we've been reading in the book of Revelation. The idea is the strong connection between the Holy Spirit and Jesus. They're in his hands. They're the seven eyes that he sends out into the world. And the idea, again, is the Holy Spirit being sent into the world and it is the Holy Spirit, which is the connecting point between God and the apostles in the giving of the revelation. The Holy Spirit was not going to speak of his own authority. He was going to speak what, what was revealed to him. He will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Okay, so Fancher's commentary. Seven spirits, Holy Spirit. Now, then, getting back to the text there, I want to read again Revelation 1. Verse 4, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, look at verse 5, and from Jesus Christ. Please notice the way the sentence is structured. First you got God the Father, then you got the seven spirits and Jesus Christ. The positioning of the seven spirits between God the Father and Jesus Christ identifies it as being the Holy Spirit and the subject. I mean, that, that just nails it down right there because you have the grace and the truth, then you've got the Father, then you've got the seven spirits, then you've got Jesus. The positioning of the seven spirits between God the Father and Jesus, again, is to nail down who is being, who's being talked about here. It's the Holy Spirit, which is not really that difficult to figure out, seven being the holy number. Okay, but now let's talk about Jesus Christ. Notice the things that are said about him. And from Jesus Christ, this is verse 5, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. You're going to be finding these particular phrases are going to be scattered through the book of Revelation in connection to Jesus the Christ, the Lamb. The first one I want to look at with you is the concept of the faithful witness. Revelation 3 and verse 4, in the letter to the church of the Laodiceans, he says, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Okay. True witness to what? The truth is the best way to put it, Randy. The truth. Jesus came to bear witness to the truth. Do you remember what he said to Pilate when Pilate was asking him, are you a king? For this reason he came into the world was to bear witness to the truth. He came to tell us the truth about God, the truth about himself, the truth about ourselves, the truth about heaven and hell, the truth about how to have your sins forgiven and avoid hell and go to heaven. He came to tell us the truth about how to live. But that whenever he was being questioned by Pilate, did Jesus never answer his questions at all. No, he actually did answer. He actually did answer some of his questions. When Jesus was before the Sanhedrin, though, before he even came before Pilate, and the high priest says, I adjourn you by the living God. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? What did he say? I am. Jesus told the truth about who he was. He is and was the faithful and true witness about God, about who he is. He never lied, ever, about any subject he spoke about. So he is the faithful witness, the faithful and true witness. Getting back to the phrase, Jesus the Christ, the firstborn from the dead. Okay, there's two things in this particular phrase. One of them has to do with terminologies connected to family. In the ancient Hebrew world, in the family unit, first came the father. Who came second? The son. Which son? 
firstborn son. The firstborn son has preeminence in the family with only one individual above him who is the father. There's a second thing here. Not only is Jesus having preeminence as firstborn in the family of God, he also is the firstborn from the dead. That is the idea of the resurrection to eternal life. You're going to be seeing this referred to again, but right now let's go back and before we get to Revelation to Colossians 1 and verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And so, who is from the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, is a phrase referring to, look at the close of this verse, preeminence. Preeminence. In the beginning was the Word. Everything was created through Him. He was there in the beginning. But He's also the firstborn, key phrase, from the dead. He's the firstborn from the dead. And the firstborn being there's going to be others coming after him, but he's the first one to die never and die and rise to never die again. That's crucial. There were people that were raised from the dead before Jesus, but they died again. They did not receive the spiritual body. They rose and died in their original body and stayed dead after they died, after they were raised from the dead. Lazarus, okay. Jesus died, rose from the dead, never to die again. He's the first fruits. He's the firstborn from the dead. And so that phrase is referring to a position of preeminence in the universe. There's God the Father, and behind God the Father is the Son, the firstborn Son, the firstborn from the dead. Now going to Revelation 1 and 18. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and I have the keys of Hades and death. How much time do I have? I got about 10 minutes. I've got to figure out how much I'm going to talk about some of these verses. Because <laughs> this is a good one. Okay. I am he who lives. He's alive right now. He was dead, but he's alive how long? Forevermore. This is why he's the first begotten, firstborn from the dead. Because his resurrection after he rose from the dead was never to die again. And when he says, I have the keys to Hades and death, Hebrews talks about this in the second chapter, how he had to come in the form of flesh and blood like we are. He had to die and rise from the dead in order to conquer death and the one who had the power over death, who is who? Satan. And then free us from bondage to Satan, sin, and death. And so the fact that he has the keys to Hades and death, what do keys do? They open. Okay, you remember what, what, what Jesus said to Peter in Matthew 16? Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The whole idea is Jesus has control and power over death and Hades now. And the reason there's going to be a resurrection is because he rose from the dead never to die again. And so in the context here, when you talk about Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead, he's talking about his preeminence, and the fact that he was the first one to rise from the dead never to die again. Revelation 2 and 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write these things, says the first and the last, he who was dead and came to life. So here again he's referring to the fact he was dead, he came back to life. But notice now the connection here, the first and the last. Remember I told you earlier, in the very opening you find those phrases connected to God the Father. Now you're going to be seeing as you go throughout the book of Revelation connected to Jesus as well. The writings of John are some of the best texts in the entire New Testament to help us understand the nature of Jesus the Christ. When I say the nature, I'm talking about the fact that Jesus is God in the flesh. Okay, Revelation chapter 2, 26 to 27. Put yourself back in the shoes of those who are going through the persecution. Do you believe Jesus is the Christ at the right hand of God, having all authority in heaven and on earth? Yeah, I do. I believe that. Then how on earth is it that his people are being allowed to be killed if he's the king? You see the question? Is God really God? Is Jesus really the king? Does he have all authority in heaven and on earth? If he does, then why is this happening to us? Why are we being allowed to be killed? And so you need to realize the book of Revelation answers these questions. 
it answers the questions as to why they're being allowed to be killed. Going to Revelation 2, 26 and 27. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel. Notice this phrase, as I also have received from my father. Okay, th this is the closing of the second chapter. This is one of those phrases, one of those sections that's talking about those that overcome. Jesus has already received from the Father the power over the nations. He does have all authority in heaven and on earth. He is the king of this world. This is his world, and he's the king of it. But he's talking here about those who overcome are going to be allowed to share in that reign with him. So what do we do on this side? We serve God. What do we do on the other side? We serve God. <laughs> yeah, that's it. We serve God. Now, we serve God then. And so those who are going to die for their faith, we're going to be allowed the honor of reigning with Christ. He says the same thing again in the third chapter, in the close of the third chapter. He just says it a different way. Verse 21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Jesus has already overcome. He's already sat down with his father on his throne. He's already at the right hand of God right now, right now. And those who overcome, he's going to grant to sit on thrones with him. Do you remember what the 20th chapter is about? Do I have it on the outline? On the 20th chapter of Revelation. Okay. And the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation in verse 4 is where you have those who have been beheaded for their faith, for the word of God and the testimony which they held. Where are they? They're sitting on thrones. They're sitting on thrones. And so they're reigning with Christ. Okay. Revelation 5 and verse 9. Getting back to the text. And they sang a new song saying... You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. Because back here, remember, early in the very beginning, we were talking about Jesus who washes from our sins in his own blood. That's chapter 1, verse 5. Here in chapter 5, verse 9. Chapter 5, again, is the main verse about the Lamb. What does it have to say about the Lamb? For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your own blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Why is Jesus even called the Lamb? In the Old Testament, if you sin, you go offer the lamb. And then, if you sin again, you offer another lamb. If you sin again, you offer another lamb. Jesus' blood is the blood of the lamb that takes away sin, and you ain't got to keep offering sheep. He's taking care of it. All of our sins that are going to be forgiven by God, every single one of them, everything you've said and done that's going to be forgiven by God, is forgiven the same way, by the power of the blood of the Lamb. We sin, and it's through the blood of the Lamb the sin ultimately is taken away. And so that is the way he's referred to here in the fifth chapter. He has redeemed us with his blood. He has washed us with his blood to where our sins are forgiven. Let's keep going. Chapter 7 and verse 14. And I said to him, Sir, you know, so he said to me, these are the ones who have come out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And so, standing before the throne of God, serving God, worshiping God with all the saved, and sitting there with white robes, how on earth am I going to be allowed to experience that? The answer is given here. I've washed my robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The only way I can stand before God holy is that my sins are forgiven. And that's true with everybody standing before the throne of God. Okay, next phrase here, going back to the text here. In Revelation 1, verse 6, And made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the way the text closes here in chapter 1, verse 6. Uh, very, qu very quickly, some translations render this kingdom and priest. Um, I'm going with kings and priests. If you're reigning on a throne with Christ, what does that make you? A king. He's the king of kings. You're reigning with him. You're a king. 
if you have access to the throne of God and you can approach God in prayer, what does that make you? A priest. In the physical realm, the highest thing you can attain to is king. And the spiritual realm on earth, the highest thing you can attain to is priest. Through Jesus Christ, we're both. Ultimately, we will reign with Christ. And then we have access to the throne of God. We're all priests, a holy priesthood. And we offer up sacrifices to God, the fruit of our lips. You have access to God for anything and anyone at any time. That's the privilege that we have as Christians. He's made you a king. He's made you a priest. He says the same thing in chapter 5, verse 10. And have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. And so again, reigning with Christ is why you're a king. Access to God by prayer is the way you're a priest. You're allowed in the presence of God, you're a priest. Only the priest could go into the holy place, and only the high priest could go into the holy of holies. We can approach the throne of God any time we want, for anyone and anything. Whether you realize it or not, that makes you holy and makes you a priest. And then Revelation 1 and 7. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, and they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. The phrase, him coming in the clouds, goes back to Daniel 7, uh, and the Son of Man coming in the clouds. But when it is said here that he's going to be coming in the clouds, this has to do with his authority and punishment coming because he has the authority to mete out the punishment. You find the same phrase used over in Matthew 26, verse, 20, verse 64. Jesus said to him, It is as you said, nevertheless I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Who is he talking to here in the context? He's talking to the high priest who just asked him the question, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And they've said Jesus is worthy of death. When Jesus says you will see the Son of Man, they're talking about Daniel 7, and he's saying I am the Christ. And when he says, sitting at the right hand of the power, he's talking about, I'm going to have authority over you. And when he says, coming in the clouds of heaven, that is, I'm going to judge you and it ain't going to be good. Time's coming in the future when you're going to stand before me and it's not going to be good on you that day. You find the same phrase over in Matthew 24, verse 30. And the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with the power of great glory. What's he talking about here? He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Not a good day for the Hebrews. And so the phrase coming in the clouds is talking about him coming with authority for punishment. And so all I've done here is show you the opening verses 4, 5, and 6 are talking about God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus the Christ, the Lamb. We'll stop right there. Okay.